Hmm? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I hope you guys can uh, see from the screen. Uh, is it visible now? Yep. Yes. All right. So, uh, it's not full screen though. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's good now. Oops. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, the topic today is about uh, adopting circular economy into a flexible housing project. Uh, may I know, um, anybody ever heard about circular economy before? All right, I cannot see the screen, but um, just maybe, uh, I don't know, raise your, raise your hand. Anybody heard about circular economy before? Except Mahmoud. <laughs> <coughs> Other than Mahmoud, uh, anybody heard about circular economy? Have you, do you have any idea what is circular economy? No. Okay. No, right? All right. Okay. Let, let me just, uh, because I, I need to minimize and maximize the screen. Okay. Uh, pardon me with that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's just um, run through this. Uh, uh, Guma already introduced me just now. Okay. Uh, let me just share my experience in this. Uh, architecture uh, as soon as, as as soon as i finish my part 2 in uh, from uia back in 2005 i i practiced in johor bahru for 4 years uh, as a project architect uh, at that time i involved a lot in uh, housing projects i became the project architect for uh, i think for for that 4 years um I handle, I think, almost uh, more than 20 projects. So somehow, um, that uh, during that moment, I, I build up my passion towards housing. Okay, so this is uh, how it started. <clears throat> um, and also, uh, during that time, the, the, the problems of the affordable housing it's already became the problems at, the, at that moment, at that particular of time. And until today, it's not being resolved. So, um, you know, I've always, you know, uh, we as an architect, we always been trained to uh, solve our problems. Okay, so we always wanted to, okay, how we want to solve this problem. We know that the affordable housing is not enough. So, as, as an architect, uh, what can what can we do? What can we uh, you know propose so that we can um, you know try to solve a bit of the problem? Okay. Um, uh, during practice, okay, I realized that uh, there's nothing much you can you can do. Okay. Um, ever since, yeah, of course, you are not the boss. So normally in the practice, you know. The architect sadly they just follow whatever you know instruction from the client, and then the the housing end up to be a typical housing, okay, and not not so much on you know solving the social issues, so solving the societal issues. So it's kind of uh, frustrating, and therefore uh, uh, during during the the industrial or during the practice i've already built up this uh, the needs to do research okay uh, i've uh, i've started my interest to do some research even though i'm in practice okay <clears throat> as i mentioned uh, it's never came into into my mind to become um, you know lecturers or to to jump into education i always wonder why uh, you know my lecturer become lecturer despite you know having um, so many years in the in the architecture education and then uh, you know you end up become educator i never uh, that never came into my sense so uh, but you know uh, suddenly um, <clears throat> after 4 years of uh, experience in the industry and then after that i joined um, government under ministry the then ministry of internal security to become a project architect also I feel that my life is a bit saturated, okay? Uh, there's nothing much I can do, and um, at least uh, if not 
you know, changing the things. At least I want to write something so that people can read my piece of work and then, you know, something can be done to improve the system. Uh, okay, uh, from that moment I build up, as I mentioned, I kind of uh, like uh, research to do research. <clears throat> After only six months in the Ministry of Internal Security, I decided to join UPM. At that time, I'm just a tutor. Um, I'm still um, have no idea what I'm going to do in the uh, next future, but then when I was offered the position, I was told that, okay, um, we will send you to do a master and also later to do a PhD, to complete the PhD, because uh, uh, then you will have, uh, you know, I have a bit of experience in the practice and then uh, a company with this uh, uh, higher um, education uh, certificate, so I can, you know, merge these two knowledge together. So that's where I, you know, I joined in 2008 in uh, UPM and in 2010 I pursued my master and then uh, 2010 master and in 2012 I started my PhD and then I completed everything in 2016. <clears throat> so that's where my interest from the housing and then the, this uh, open building, okay, the, the guru is uh, John Habraken. He's a Dutch uh, architect who now resides in uh, USA. He became a professor in one of the universities in USA. <coughs> so um, he, um, he came up with this uh, term of uh, flexible housing. And flexible housing is part of the industrial building system where everything manufactured in the factory. So, Everything that manufactured uh, before uh, or, or not constructed on site 100% is called fabricated. Okay, so that's where I merge this idea together and then uh, I propose a new business model. And then I have this flexible and the IBS together. And then I have another <coughs> theory of uh, circular economy where I combine together become a new business model. So, um, doing master or PhD in research, <coughs> we are focusing towards a novelty of the idea where there's, uh, you know, nobody talked about it before, nobody ever done it before, then you came up with this new idea. So, uh, that's uh, how uh, we started research to make it novel. Okay, and then, um, when I presented my first idea in 2013 in uh, ETH Zurich, um, I was uh, uh, given a plot by the company from Finland. Uh, they also presented during their session and then uh, they liked the idea of this uh, flexible housing uh, using circular economy. All right, <clears throat> what is circular economy? Okay, imagine, at the moment, <clears throat> your handphone, eh? every one of you got handphone. Okay, I, uh, suddenly the torchlight is open. Okay, <clears throat> uh, imagine the handphone that you use. Okay, uh, I wonder how many times that you change your handphone for, for the past five years. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, for me, I think I change the phone uh, every every. <laughs> I'm uh, sadly to say this, uh, but I think every year, <laughs> every <laughs> oh no, uh, from uh, previous previous one. Okay, <laughs> this is uh, iPhone uh, X. This is iPhone. Sorry, I don't know which one is iPhone X. Uh, I think this one is iPhone X, and then this one is the latest one. So um, I I. I tend to be uh, frequently changing the phone, okay, but that, that's, that's not the idea, okay, the idea is that <clears throat> you know that for every time the handphone is produced, um, it actually involves a lot of key resources, okay, not walking the talk, okay, now um, I will remain this handphone like uh, maybe for the next five years, okay, um, <clears throat> so 
every time this new handphone being uh, you know uh, came up to the market it involved a lot of resources you know it involved a lot of uh, <clears throat> materials involved a lot of labors okay <clears throat> because at the moment the current economy is linear okay from make to dispose i will explain about it later but then imagine that if we can you know recycle not only recycle it's a circular now what you give is what you get okay so what if the the handphone have you have you heard about um refurbished handphone have you heard about that yep. i think uh, yeah i think it's become uh, it becomes trend nowadays that um <clears throat> They are selling the refurbished phone, eh? where the, the 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 phone look new, but it's a used phone. Okay, so the idea is just is just that they just upgrade the component inside, and then they just change the outer part of the handphone. So that but the 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 other part is uh, the original part, the tuning part. Okay, so that's actually part of the circular economy. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I hope you get the idea eh, about the circular economy. Okay, so the idea of this circular economy is to close the loop. Okay, so the, what we mean by close the loop is that, okay, if you look at the slide from the primary resources, the exploration, and then the mining, processing, raw material, design, production, use and reuse, collection, recycling. Okay, normally, it will just stop at recycling okay but now we want to have it a loop a closed loop where is uh, the loop is like infinity okay so <clears throat> in order to um, to uh, uphold this principle okay uh, we need to to look into the background okay the, the school of thoughts so actually from cradle to cradle, okay, cradle to cradle is from uh, German chemist and visionary Michael Bronger. Uh, they developed together with American architect Bill McDonough the cradle to cradle concept. So the cradle to cradle concept, uh, because previously it's a cradle to grave, okay, from cradle to grave. It's like okay after uh, all the uh, materials have been dumped so it become grave it's like okay uh, it, at the end of the of the um, the life of the products but now cradle to cradle means it needs to be it beyond the recycle it's no longer recycle recycle is just you um, <coughs> you recycle again and then uh, some of the materials being uh, you know uh, left out and then uh, only certain part which is being recycled but we we talking about the entire thing can be uh, recycled. Okay, that that's what we call um, uh, circular economy. Okay, and then the next strategy, which is uh, for performance economy, is from uh, Walter Sahil. Okay, Walter Sahil is also an architect and industrial analyst. Okay, he's the first architect who sketched this uh, idea in nineteen seventy six um in the european commission okay um he imagined this uh towards energy that we use okay how we can uh, regenerate the the energy and then to make it um circular economy okay so these are some of the gurus i would say uh, sifus in this uh, who came up with the circular economy and then biomimicry i think uh, most of you um, familiar with this uh, by Janine Benyus, uh, innovation inspired by nature. Okay, uh, he, she defined her approach as a new discipline that studies nature's best ideas and then imitate those this design and process to solve human problems. <clears throat> you imagine like a plant. Okay, plants. Okay, it grows and then it, uh, yep, it uh, become um, uh, fertilized. Okay, and then it dies and then. Uh, uh, the, the seed become you know for for the next generation of the of the plant so 
that's actually the the principle of circular economy as well okay I'll just show this uh, video so that you have the idea and then you can see uh, how Walter Sahel look like uh, because you need to know his uh, his uh, original idea so that you understand the what circular, circular economy is all about. Okay, let me just play this. Whether clothing, furniture, electronics, vehicles or buildings, we surround ourselves with objects. Oops, internet. That we use only for a limited time. The resources which are extracted from planet Earth to make these objects are used once or twice and then dumped. Yet, the resources on our planet are non-renewable and finite, except for rainfall, sunlight, biomass, animals and people. And our global commons have become waste dumps. Within 60 years, we have filled the oceans with millions of low-tech plastic objects and space with thousands of high-tech objects. So, the present industrial economy is not compatible with the natural resources and waste dumps available on planet Earth. More of the same is no business model for success. We need to create higher standards of living from a more intelligent resource use. More from less. I have an idea how to do it. Circularity. It's great. Circularity. That is how nature works. Water, biomass, CO2, seasons. Nature works in cycles. Waste free. Water and land are special cases. Sea level rise and erosion permanently reduce the land surface. And deforestation will diminish rainfall. As a result, droughts and wildfires may become more frequent and vicious so. For thousands of years, mankind was part of nature, functioning in loops. Use it up, wear it out, make it do and do without was the motto. But this was a circular economy of poverty and scarcity. 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution uncoupled people from nature. Human ingenuity turned coal and iron into steam engines to replace horses, enabling men to produce enough food and shelter for all and provide faster mobility on land and water. 100 years ago, human ingenuity developed electricity, opening up the vertical dimension in cities and turning night into day. And oil complemented coal as abundant energy supply. Then, chemistry, engineering and finance opened the floodgates of mass production and turned industrialized countries into societies of abundance allowing the world population to triple, billions of people to increase their health and quality of life, and democracy to flourish within the last 70 years. This is industrial man's success story. But abundance also led to oversupply, saturated markets, and omnipresent waste. We lost control of our waste dumps because the industrial economy is linear. The industrial economy is like a river. You cannot stop it or you cause a flood. So the, the goods that are produced have to be And the goods have to be produced 
to maintain the income and GDP wealth for the nations. Growth in the industrial economy means throughput. It means producing more, whereas in the circular economy, growth can be measured as an increase in quantity and quality of stocks. In other words, the industrial economy is about flows and throughput in a one-way street that ends in a cul-de-sac. It is also about lost liability control. At the point of sale, liability for the use of objects and their end-of-life waste passes from manufacturers to buyers, consumers, to you and me, to society at large, nobody's liability. The cost will be borne by the taxpayer. Now, the circular industrial economy is applying circularity to the stocks of manufactured objects, cultural and human capital. But this is a circular economy of abundance, not of scarcity. And it is driven by human ingenuity and social innovation, such as repair cafes and neighborhood health, not by sheer necessity. To understand how circular industrial economy works, let us have a look at cars. Imagine that car manufacturers find a way to double the product life of cars. That would reduce by half the number of cars that need to be produced in a saturated market, could reduce therefore resource consumption by half, it would re reduce the waste uh, of cars scrapped by half, but it would also reduce the revenue of manufacturers by half. You know, I'd like to try that. Car manufacturers now have two options. They can increase the revenue in the use phase, and they can increase the revenue in the, in the fly phase. In the use phase, it means investing in operation and maintenance, whereas before they only invested in manufacturing plants. And in the end of life phase, it means getting parts, components back for remanufacturing and reuse in new cars. So closing the loop, but as they are not the owners of the cars, there may be other people who take other options. So therefore the car manufacturer, if he really wants to exploit the full product life of cars, he has to change his business model from selling cars to selling the utilization of cars. All right. Um, you can uh, you can watch this uh, further in the uh, YouTube. Okay, it's about um, how this uh, circular economy was uh, already applied. Okay, uh, uh, mainly in the manufacturing sector. Okay, let me just. Uh, <clears throat> show uh, some other examples okay as i mentioned just now um in uh, handphone also you have this uh, refurbish uh, uh, models uh, sell in the market okay so that is actually approach from circular, circular economy and also as being discussed by uh, william sahil just now car also being uh, remanufactured uh, like for example, okay, uh, there's uh, some business model, for example, by Kia, by uh, Renault, and uh, some of the uh, top manufacturers. Uh, like for example, my cars. Okay, um, I was given this, um, I own a Kia. Okay, I was given this uh, package where after five years, I can sell back my car to, this, uh, to the manufacturers, which is Kia. And then I will get 50% uh, of what I paid uh, during my, you know, my uh, early, uh, early uh, when I bought it. Okay, so it is being implemented as uh, already in the uh, automotive or in the car manufacturing uh, sector. Okay, uh, <clears throat> um, so the circular economy is now is new way of seeing the world. Okay. 
uh, how we want to reduce the waste while giving a whole new value to the concept of sustainability. Now, in order to implement this system, the products need to be durable. See, the product needs to be, uh, it cannot be uh, la, okay? So it needs to be uh, sturdy, it needs to be durable because right now you're talking about a product that the lifespan may be, you know, 100 years because you want to give repurpose to the product, okay? So let me just uh, show another example, which is, um, this is, uh, <coughs> um, I don't know whether this company already launched, but uh, they came up with uh, the idea of the handphone, okay? the modular handphone okay maybe for example if i want to upgrade this phone to maybe a new um a new uh spec new specification of a new phone so i would just you know change the the camera maybe and then change maybe the outer look of it which is a very cosmetic and then maybe change of the uh, processor which is uh, easily, I you know, uh, I can get it from market and then I can just uh, easily uh, change it myself. So then I can have a bigger spec. So, but the, the, the phone is still remain the same. It's still, you know, I don't need to throw this phone and then buy a new phone. Okay, so let's just uh, watch this another video. <laughs> So this is uh, another idea of putting circular economy into a mobile phone, okay, where uh, the idea of the circularity is uh, maintained in the uh, and then the, the loop, and then to make the phone uh, modular, okay, modular in the sense that if you have to upgrade, you just be, uh, buy the components and then you upgrade the phone to be, uh, you know, whatever specs that you can afford. So that's uh, another strategy. And then um uh, some of the pioneers in this circular economy uh, we have uh, Renault, Philips, Rico and uh, you know Heineken so they are uh, some of the leading proponents of circular manuf manufacturing okay this is another strategy of uh, you know they are not they are no longer selling the product they are selling the service okay imagine the lighting okay the lighting um you have the the how many lights that you want to use okay how many capacity capacity that you want to use for the for the lighting okay rather than selling the bulb 
uh, the uh, Philips now selling the performance of the of the product. Okay, so let's just uh, watch uh, another video of this. What is Philips circular lighting, and how does it fit within the principles of a circular economy? As opposed to a linear economy, the circular economy focuses on bringing as many materials as possible back into the production loop. Make, use, return. We've completely rethought the way in which lighting solutions can contribute to a circular economy. Philips Circular Lighting brings together four key components. Light as a service, circular product design, reverse logistics, and collaboration. In our light as a service business model, you don't need to make an upfront investment. You save from day one. Your contract includes maintenance, reverse logistics support, everything you'll ever need. But it all starts with a smart circular product design. Our modular luminaire design makes it easy to replace standardized components and install upgrades like data enabled lighting. Thanks to reverse logistics, used products are not disposed of as waste. Instead, they are returned to the manufacturer. Whenever possible, we refurbish the products for future use. And if a product has reached the end of its lifetime, we harvest functional parts to reuse them and recycle the rest of the materials. Philips Lighting will support the full feedback loop that brings a product's components back into the production cycle. To help your organization contribute to a sustainable circular economy, Philips Circular Lighting is the best possible choice to minimize your carbon footprint and achieve instant savings. We are committed to staying at the cutting edge of lighting innovation for the planet and for a more sustainable future. Okay, another example, as I mentioned, Rico, uh, this uh, photocopying uh, machine company. So if you notice uh, at the moment, um, you don't need to buy the photocopy machine anymore. Okay, so what this uh, company uh, doing now at the moment is that they lease the photocopy machine uh, to the company. So the, the, uh, the leaser, okay, they just pay for how many, you know, how many copies that they use, okay, for maybe for one month and maybe for maybe six months and then one year. So you don't need to, to, to pay or to buy the whole photocopy machine, you know, the photocopy machine is very big and it's very huge and then uh, uh, it can be, you know, very expensive. So what they are doing now is they lease, okay, the, the machine to the uh, office, okay. Well, okay, the problems in the construction industry. Okay, as uh, as mentioned earlier by Stahel, um, at the moment we are using as uh, what mentioned linear economy. Okay, uh, nearly forty eight million tons of building waste produced each year by the construction industry, and then you know uh, sometimes uh, the incinerator you know cannot cope with all this uh, construction waste every year okay uh, if you see that um, concrete timber and steel only a small portion of them can be you know reuse incinerate or downcycle so what happened to the rest okay of the of the products <clears throat> Let's look into circular economy in cities, okay? Uh, by 2050, two-thirds of us will live in city, okay? This is uh, called urbanization process. However, our urban centers are grappling with the effects of our current technique waste economy, okay? Uh, at the moment, as mentioned, the linear economy, uh, linear system, cities consume over 75% of natural resources, produce over 50% of global waste, and emit between 60 to 80% of greenhouse gases. Uh, circular economy provides the opportunity to rethink. Okay, so right now, <coughs> let's think everything in circularity. So I'm going into macro first in terms of cities. Let's watch another video. Okay, we today we just uh, watch a video so that we give idea because um, uh, why I'm showing the idea because uh, this term may be uh, quite new for, for most of you. So just grab this idea from a different uh, perspective and different maybe uh, uh, part of, uh, for example, just now from manufacturing and then we have uh, now we are looking into 
uh, cities and later we go to construction and then housing and uh, towards a micro. Eh? By 2050, two-thirds of us will live in cities. Already, cities are where we consume 75% of our natural resources, produce over 50% of global waste, and emit up to 80% of global greenhouse gases. These are consequences of our linear take-make-waste model. But cities are also places which concentrate on innovation, education, finance, culture, and where people exchange ideas. Pragmatic and acting quickly, they play a leading role in politics and the economy. They can lead the way to develop a circular economy. The circular economy can help cities to thrive and become more livable and resilient, helping to meet urban priorities around housing, transport and economic development. The circular economy can also help cities meet the sustainable development goals and their climate targets. It starts with three principles. Design out waste and pollution. Avoid creating waste in the first place. For example, with products and parts created within cities when needed, using materials that can be reused, recycled or composted. Making use of untapped space in buildings, transport, and using renewable energy to power the city, making them healthier and cleaner. Keep products in use. So products are no longer used just once. They're reused, repaired and refurbished. And people gain access to the things they need, be it space, products or transport, in new ways. For example, through sharing rather than owning and connecting people to their neighbours and communities. And cities are planned so that materials flow. Regenerate natural systems so that valuable nutrients return to the soil and air and water quality improves in the city and in the countryside beyond. Ready to get started? The Ellen MacArthur Foundation's suite of resources help you take the lead and create a city fit for today. The time to act is now. Okay, uh, so we're moving from cities to build environment now. How, uh, as an architect, as a future architect, how we want to develop appropriate strategies for the design life? Okay, this one is um, it's a useful project which uh, developed by, um, uh, I for forgot the name of the company uh, in, in the UK. So uh, I just want to highlight in terms of the uh, space, okay, since that we, uh, as an architect, we deal with space. So the first uh, part is uh, developing appropriate circular economy strategies for the design life of the building and asset. And the layers of that building and asset was another common theme. Okay, for the structure which has a long life, durability and ease of maintenance are appropriate strategies. For fit out which has a much shorter lifespan, service models, take back schemes and design for reuse and recycling should be the main approaches. So imagine a housing product okay or uh, a construction product which you know have a long design life and very du durable and uh, a brick you know that can be reusable again and again so that it can be repurposed for another purpose <clears throat> okay this is um, uh, close enough uh, design for flexibility and adaptability it's a recycle house shift construction by aru design uh, I think it's a good uh, for you to, to, to listen about this uh, because uh, the prototype already built uh, in, in London. Uh, let's just watch this. We're standing inside the uh, circular building by Arup. This started a number of months ago when we started exploring the idea of the circular economy and asking the question of what would it mean to build a building in circular economy. And for us, it's about starting to ask questions both of ourselves as designers and of the industry about how would you apply circular economy principles to a construction industry. I think we're continuing to, to live in a world where we don't make uh, the best use of the resources that are available to us. 
Um, we still have far too many negative impacts on the environment when it comes to the construction sector and other associated industries. So we need to start to rethink how our industry works and how we can become sustainable in a much more holistic and integrated way. At the moment, we work in an industry where we design an object almost like a one-off and then engage the suppliers and then build it as one element. Whereas from day one, we need to think about how will we deconstruct it, how will we layer things up so they can easily be demountable, um, and how can we inherently design a, a end of life and flexibility and adaptability so it can be applied to the circular company. So we started by, by looking at this house as a series of components that actually could be clamped together and then disassembled quite easily. So then we can send them back to the manufacturers and put them back into the manufacturing stream. So starting with the, the steel frame, um, that's from offcuts from the other side. It's, it's bolted together and so we can easily re-bolt it apart. It's also a rigid steel frame so we're, we can actually uh, provide uh, adaptability and flexibility with inside the form and that's another element to the circular economy. On the steel frame, we put these prefabricated panels. What's unique about these panels is actually they're made from uh, agricultural byproduct. It's a, after you do cropping on site, it's all the waste that's left behind. So basically it's a wheat waste, it's then compressed together with, uh, in a non-toxic way. Um, and then these boards were uh, computer controlled cut, put together, put together on a track. And Okay, uh, you can uh, watch further in this uh, recyclable house ship uh, construction to circular economy. Okay, now <clears throat> um, let's go back to the history of uh, housing in uh, Malaysia. Okay, um, did you notice? Okay, do you notice that um, our traditional house, okay, in Malaysia, our traditional house kampung, where a um, non toxic to sorry. produce. Uh, non hazard where you know it can be uh, it built by timber and then not only that it can be transported to uh, uh, elsewhere okay it can you can carry the whole house and then in fact um, the jointing is made from tongue and groove and then of course you can disassemble okay the the the, the timber and then to repurpose for another <laughs> another purpose so our forefathers uh, as has already implemented this circular uh, economy uh, i suppose and uh, now is is a task for uh, in this modern okay it's a challenge for for modern world how we want to uh, use back this uh, circular economy principles in our new design okay so uh, at the moment i'm teaching uh, master students in upm so i'll challenge them to uh, next semester in the final year, they're going to be um, <coughs> approaching housing projects. So, you know, this is a time for you to explore. Uh, okay, maybe this uh, can be some of the concepts that you, uh, you can start with. Okay, so this is the idea where, you know, flexible housing as a potential solution. This is part of my uh, PhD thesis as well. Where, what if, uh, what, do, what does it mean by flexible is that what if the unit, you know, can be small, can be bigger, and it can be smaller again. Okay, the, this is because uh, the demographic of the family in Malaysia, okay, for example, uh, you start, start off with a single, okay, you become a, you are a bachelor, you're still single, and then after a certain uh, time, certain years, you get married. Okay, so you have a partner and then maybe you have a children. Okay, so maybe you have three children, you have four children. But certain point of time, your children will move out from the, from the house. Okay, you imagine if your house is really big, you know, when you um, left only with your wife or with your, with your husband, <coughs> there's a portion of the house which is, you know, unused. So what if this flexible allow you to return back the component to the factory so that it can be repurposed, it can be used uh, for, uh, for other people, okay, for other families. So this is what we call as a flexible housing. So we, um, uh, in this uh, study, I combine flexible housing and business model and also innovative leasing. 
You remember just now I mentioned that uh, RICO use uh, innovative leasing as part of uh, they don't uh, sell the photography machine but they lease it. So what if uh, leasing is uh, you know one of the option? You have already leasing um, business model in housing, but you in this case you lease the whole component, okay? So that uh, there's a contract between the leaser and also the provider. Uh, there's a certain time that you you need to maintain in terms of the housing because um, <clears throat> for the example of uh, Rico, uh, during this leasing period. Uh, Rico will do all the maintenance, okay, will do all this, uh, um, everything going to do with the replacement of the um, spare parts and everything will be done by the manufacturers, okay. At the moment also, Renault, um, you can buy, uh, no, you can lease your car, you don't need to buy your car, for example, maybe after you graduate, you don't want to buy the car because you don't want to have a commitment. So you can subscribe to this uh, new business model by Renault. For example, Renault is uh, one of the company which uh, already proposed this idea. You just lease the, the product or the, the car within a certain period of time. For example, maybe you want to, okay, I just want to have uh, lease the car for three years. So you just pay for the car and then you just uh, take care of the fuel that you want to use uh, for the for the car, of course, definitely when you want to move around. But the rest of it, in terms of maintenance and everything, you don't need to pay because you not will uh, you know uh, will maintain everything. So it is same goes to this uh, flexible housing concept where all the maintenance will be uh, running by the company. <clears throat> so we frame the idea, we combine flexible housing with idea of circularity. So these are the questions that we want to formalize. Okay, and then we come up, we propose a new business model. We have, uh, these are the examples of the business model components, value proposition, you need to know the target customers, you need to know the customer service, uh, what that were channel and networks, key resources, partnership, cost structure, revenues, and key activities. After that, um, uh, and then we combine how we want to make the flexible housing can be, you know, lease and then remove and then uh, put back on the on the side. Okay, so this is an example of the life cycle illustration, where for example, Mike, twenty-four years single rentals, um, uh, rental single unit for two years. After two years, he move out and then <coughs> the unit being uh, reconfigured. And then being uh, brought back to the factory, and then uh, after that, no, oh, let me just okay reconfigure, and then uh, coming back to the uh, factory, and then uh, Rita and Ian couple renting double unit for three years, and then they move up, the thing re reconfigure again in the factory, and then uh, Hassan and family renting for five years and offered the company rent to buy and then we have certain uh, package rent to buy and rent to own and then and not only that the unit okay once after you fulfill all the um, uh, buying period you can relocate into somewhere else so this is the beauty of the product where the unit can be transferred to somewhere else okay <clears throat> so uh, we have several package in this uh, model where we have a standard rental, the rental based on unit chosen. Of course, if uh, the unit is in uh, Kuala Lumpur compared to Kuala Tengganu, the rental will be different, okay, according to market price. And then we have the rent to own and then we have rent to buy. So rent to own, what's the difference between rent and uh, rent, rent to buy is that uh, the purchaser have intention to buy, okay, but uh, he or she doesn't have money at the moment, so uh, these are the you know the conditions. Okay, compared to the rent to buy, where have no intention to buy, but then after several period of time, they decided to buy. So the company will uh, selling the price according to market price with twenty percent discount. Okay, uh, we have a okay. Um, 
<clears throat> so this uh, some of the ideas of this uh, construction where we have this uh, shell unit we call it it's just like a whole unit and then this become the slot where you can just slot into the the unit this is actually from the open building concept okay we have the shell and then we have the infill this is what we call shell and this is, is what we call infill okay and then there's also the um uh, we have a okay okay yeah if uh, you have any question please just uh, you know uh, write on the chat uh, i will respond later and then there's a uh, option to actually customize also the the accessories of the uh, unit so that is up to the affordability of the of the user <coughs> And then uh, you can add on and then step five, okay, the customer can, uh, uh, of course, there's an agreement, the checkout customer will be, uh, there's a contract that deal with the agreement and then delivery date will be determined. And then uh, changing phase, okay, maybe uh, they have, there's a moratorium period where within uh, um, uh, 14 months, okay, uh, you cannot change the component, but on the 15 months, you can start changing the component, you can add on and then size up and size down, okay. So, the detailed part of the calculation is in my thesis, later maybe you can uh, read on further from there. So, in um, to propose this idea, uh, we have a focus group with architects, come up with these uh, flexible ideas. Okay, and then uh, we propose uh, studio type, single unit type, double unit type, and then duplex, duplex unit type. Okay, and then um, during my PhD um, period, I've been to Japan, to Sekisu House, and I've been to Australia, Hikori Group, and the USA, and uh, of course, uh, Europe. And uh, these are some of the case study in Japan, Australia, and US. Okay. Um, since we are running out of time, I will just show uh, this one. This is a unit uh, from US, uh, Casita Homes, they call it, where the unit is uh, flexible also in terms of uh, you remember Professor moving Dumpster? in and moving up from the unit. Professor spent a year in a <clears throat> dumpster on campus to learn more about living small. While he was in that dumpster, he came up with an idea that may change affordable housing as we know it. And now, his idea is becoming a reality. Fox 7's Casey Claiborne joins us live from East Austin with that story tonight. Casey? Mike and Rebecca, it looks a little Jetsons, but trust me, this is becoming a reality faster than flying cars. It's called a casita unit, and come this fall, you'll be able to buy one. You might be able to afford one, too. Okay, this looks so much cooler than a dumpster. And wait until you see the inside. So sitting here on the bench in the casita, uh, a quick pull out here, and you've got your uh, queen size uh, Casper mattress. So a little bit easier than a dumpster. Dr. Jeff Wilson is the artist formerly known as Professor Dumpster. Actually, he still likes being called that. In 2014, the Houston Tillotson Associate Professor of Biological Sciences turned a dumpster into a place to live and he lived there for a year. Uh, I owned my stuff. It didn't own me. Um, I spent more time outdoors uh, and exploring the neighborhood. I had more disposable income. Wilson says while laying in the dumpster and looking up at the stars one night, he had an idea. Hey, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe we could make something uh, out of this experiment. Uh, for venture capital, but... I'll just say that's going pretty well. Basically, what we're talking about, a structure called a casita rack will be built. The rack will hold these casita units that will be stacked into it. Wilson says this model in East Austin is 50% smaller than what the actual units will look like. It is a 320 square foot um, mass manufacturer prefab. Okay, you can also look into this further in the YouTube. It's about um, uh, with this professor who used to live in dumpster and then came up with this idea of uh, you know um, flexible and also uh, movable uh, portable uh, units of housing. Okay. Um. All right. So, so in theory. Yeah. 
that's all for that's all for the um that's all for the lecture today i hope you guys are still awake <laughs> uh, not sleeping okay uh so that's basically uh, the whole um, idea of uh, circular economy okay you can explore further you can uh, read more of course uh, just you know the google school circular economy and then uh, ellen MacArthur foundation is one of the i uh, you know um, biggest ngo biggest uh, uh, non-government uh, organization that promote this idea uh, and uh, i think uh, uh, i was uh, I get involved uh, in the uh, workshop uh, when I was in Netherlands, so it's a good uh, insights on giving uh, what the circular economy is, uh, you know, can be applied, especially in the built environment. Uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, if there's any question, please feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, anyone has any questions in mind? You can um, type in the uh, group chat and uh